Social media giants like Facebook and Twitter have been cracking down on far-right extremists and other violent groups after the siege on the U.S. Capitol earlier this month. But many of those groups are finding ways to adapt their online presence using encrypted apps. According to a recent Vanity Fair article, apps like Telegram and Signal are gaining popularity because of the crackdown on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Parler going offline. Joining us now to expand on this cyber threat alliance, CEO Michael Daniel. Michael, explain how extremists are using networking apps like Telegram and Signal to avoid these social media crackdowns. Well, those kinds of applications are designed to enable people to communicate in peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, essentially uh, really avoiding the major social media platforms. Um, of course, those are tools, right? And in many cases, those were built to also help people to avoid, um, you know, authoritarian governments, uh, you know, surveilling their communications. Well, these two apps recently became top downloads in Apple's App Store and Google Play. Uh, and I mentioned Apple banned other apps used by the far right, like Parler. So why are Apple and Google allowing these other new apps to stay on their platforms now? Well, those things like Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, um, all of those kinds of applications have many legitimate uses uh, as well, um, including protecting communications from, you know, malicious adversaries or other nation states that wish to spy on uh, communications. Plus, which they're actually just they're very convenient uh, tools for communicating with each other and conducting business. Uh, so it's very difficult to separate out the you know, malicious use of those tools from the legitimate use of those tools. Let's shift to the SolarWinds hack and Russia. What kind of damage was done to the U.S., and what should we be concerned about moving forward? Well, I think the, you know, the truth is uh, that we don't fully know uh, the extent of the damage yet. In fact, that's actually probably one of the things that people within the federal government are working very hard to determine. Um, right now, we have evidence that there was a lot of what we would consider espionage, so collection of email uh, and other documents and things like that. So that means that the Russians were searching for plans and intentions, maybe heads up about sanctions we were going to impose or other actions we were going to take. But I think it's safe to say that the, the national security damage from this intrusion will be fairly extensive. Um, and it's going to take us a while to actually figure out what, uh, what the extent of that damage is. In the private sector, we still don't have a very good idea of how many organizations and companies have been affected by the intrusion um, or what may have even been taken or um, stolen in any way from uh, the activity. And then finally, we don't know uh, in many cases if the Russians left something behind that might actually prove to be destructive or disruptive in some way. And so doing that kind of damage assessment and that kind of mitigation is what many organizations are engaged in right now, both in the public and the private sector. That certainly seems like the big concern, particularly given that so little is actually known about the purpose behind this hack. So what are some of the biggest challenges for the Biden administration's new cybersecurity team, especially since the presidential transition in general was so delayed and rocky? Well, certainly one of the biggest challenges is going to be getting up to speed on all of the new uh, threats, uh, how they have changed since the last time that many of those uh, individuals were uh, in government and had access to intelligence community uh, conclusions and summaries about what is going on. Um, but we've got just numerous problems across the board. Uh, in addition to responding to this massive uh, espionage campaign, and that's what it appears to be at the moment. Uh, we also have the threat of ransomware uh, and its impact on the broader economy. Plus, we have the potential for malicious cyber activity uh, from various nation states uh, across the board. And then, of course, continued election interference and other uh, activities like that, and then leading all the way over into misinformation and disinformation online. So the challenges that this administration will face are, are quite numerous, and they're very significant. Well, how can private and public entities work together more closely to effectively prevent these cyber attacks, or should we just assume that they are coming? Well, I don't think you can fully prevent uh, malicious cyber activity. Um, we have to adopt much more of a risk management framework uh, to think about these. And it's really how do we 
reduce the impact? How do we reduce the risk of this malicious cyber activity to a level that we can manage uh, as a society, as an economy? But certainly, I think that uh, the public sector uh, in the form of the you know, government agencies across the board from the intelligence community to the Department of Homeland Security's uh, cybersecurity agency to law enforcement should be working with cybersecurity vendors, uh, platform providers, and other major companies uh, in the private sector to collaborate, not just to share information, but to actually collaborate on proactive actions to disrupt um, the adversaries. And that includes going after their uh, their financial system, going after the ecosystem that supplies them with malware, uh, and you know, eventually seeking to uh, impose as many penalties as possible on the individuals behind this activity. But I do think it's going to take a lot of cooperation and collaboration, um, not just within the government, but between the government and the private sector, and not just here in the United States, but globally as well. Michael Daniel, thank you. Thank you very much.